Hey, happy Friday. I'm in extremely loud Bangkok, so you might hear engine noises, and I also have dang fever, so this episode's gonna be weird, but the tech news don't stop, and I will bring it to you. This week, Microsoft announced new Intel-based Surface PCs, Pebble got relaunched by its own founder, and we got a flood of new updates around DeepSeek. Welcome to the Friday Checkout. <music> This video was sponsored by NordVPN. Okay, for my first story of the week, Microsoft launched new Intel Lunar Lake versions of both the Surface Pro 11 and Laptop 7. This was much needed as until now you could only get the modern Surface devices with Qualcomm chips, but there's one big catch. Overall, the Intel and Snapdragon models seem incredibly similar. We get the same display and size options, and physically the only changes are in the ports, such as a speed increase from USB 3.1 to 3.2 for Intel. Remarkably, even the battery life quotes on the Pro model, for example, are exactly identical. We'll see what the reviewers say eventually, but overall, these are extremely similar machines. Beside the chips, the only major difference that I can see is that the Intel models both come with an anti-reflective screen, which some may prefer. So it might surprise you then that there's a $400 cost difference between these devices. $1,500 for the Surface Pro 11 Intel model versus $1,100 for the Surface Pro 11 Qualcomm model, for example, and it's a similar picture on the laptop too. The Intel model is specifically pitched as a business-only edition, which always costs extra, but I'm also comparing it to the business edition of the Qualcomm device, so everything should be on par. There's nothing keeping consumers from just going to the Microsoft business store and buying an Intel model from there, but I'm suspecting that Microsoft specifically priced these more expensively, so most regular people would probably just go for the Qualcomm model instead. After all, they really want to push those to establish Windows on ARM as a proper platform, so I don't think they really want you to buy an Intel as a regular person just now. Anyway, beside the chip updates, Intel and Qualcomm versions both get 5G versions now, and there's an NFC option on the Intel version for reading smart cards and stuff. Sales for the Intel model start on the 18th of February, and I've left links in the description if you're not deterred by the price for some reason. Okay, for my second story of the week, Pebble is back, and officially, by the original founder of Pebble, Eric. And I'm of course talking about the e-paper display smartwatches, which were one of the first products I ever reviewed on YouTube back in the ancient days, and which I absolutely adored and still own. Anyway, Google published the majority of Pebble OS as an open source project this week, after Eric basically asked them to, which was actually a legit nice thing of them to do. And then Eric also announced a new venture called RePebble, where he wants to bring a new Pebble device to the markets too. You might recall that Pebble fell into insolvency at the end of 2016 and was then later bought by Fitbit, which itself was then bought by Google, who, of course, eventually graveyarded it, as they do with so many other projects. The community kept Pebble alive with a project called Rebel, including an app store and various services, and we now might get a full, proper revival with the original founder, all the core features, like an e-paper screen, plus what he calls some fun new stuff. He specifically mentions only wanting to build a small, narrowly focused team and is not envisioning to raise money from investors, which means that this might be a sustainable project for once too. You can sign up at repebble.com, which they're also using to gauge interest, so you should sign up if you want one. I can't wait to see what a modern Pebble would look like with modern chips and more efficient displays, and also whether or not it could actually lure me away from my Galaxy Watch 7. Okay, and for my third story of the week, we keep getting wild new updates about China's DeepSeek AI. You've probably already heard that a Chinese AI lab launched what appears to be some extremely competitive, mostly open source AI models, and now also an image generator, with perhaps the most impressive one costing just five and a half million dollars to train. Those are just the company's own claims for now, but they got everyone into such a frenzy that their servers have been completely overloaded ever since they launched, and wild new details started to appear every few hours since. Most interesting to me is that while NVIDIA chips were used to train the models, Huawei announced that for inferencing, DeepSeek was optimized to run on Huawei AI chips as well, presumably like the Huawei Ascend 910C. Many headlines claim that the DeepSeek company itself actually uses Huawei chips in its own data centers to run their models, so I tried to dig up what they're basing these claims on and I couldn't find any conclusive proof of that. But still, having day one inferencing using Huawei is a pretty big milestone for China's AI chip ambitions either way. Another interesting update is that DeepSeek appears to have used a mostly American data set for training, not something based out of China. And OpenAI also pointed out that it looks like DeepSeek basically used its ChatGPT model to train the DeepSeek LLMs without approval. Of course, this is rich in irony because OpenAI trained their models on everyone else's content without approval too, so I guess the cycle just continues. 
And while Microsoft is also investigating DeepSeek for potential improper use of OpenAI data, the company simultaneously also announced letting distilled DeepSeek R1 models run locally on Copilot Plus PCs and on Azure too. Big companies contain multitudes, I guess. And meanwhile, one more DeepSeek update on the more worrying front is that the company already had a pretty major security incident, leaving one of its critical databases exposed on the internet. Ouch. Okay, our release monitor only has one product in the form of the new Logitech Spot, a device that can detect the presence of people using millimeter wave radars. These can last up to four years on a single battery, and you can imagine them being useful for remotely knowing if a meeting room is free, for example. Pretty cool. And as for the brief, we start with Meta revealing in an earnings call that it sold 1 million Ray-Ban glasses last year. And while they still lost $5 billion on Reality Labs, in an internal memo, Zuck said that the division beat nearly all its sales and user targets for 20 2024. I still hope literally anyone other than this evil wannabe cool guy will win smart glasses, but okay. Meanwhile, from Microsoft's earnings, we learned that Xbox was doing rather poorly. Hardware sales continued to collapse, overall Xbox gaming revenue was down by 7% year over year, and even Game Pass is now increasingly talked about in terms of PC subscribers. Oh well. Meanwhile, Tesla's earnings showed that its automotive revenues were falling by 8% year on year, but its stongs actually went up because the company also promised to launch a paid robot taxi service in Austin this June. Ah yes, always the next big thing just around the corner. Over at Apple, earnings were pretty uneventful overall, with the one negative highlight being that iPhone sales kept slipping, especially in China. Last quarter, Huawei even became the top-selling brand in the country for the first time ever since its original ban, so things might be looking even tougher for Apple in the future. And talking of Chinese progress, Alibaba announced a new AI model called Quen 2.5 Max, which it claims, quote, outperforms almost across the board GPT-4.0, DeepSeek V3, and Llama 3.1, 405 billion. Looks like things are definitely heating up in China. And next, Boom's XB-1 jet has broken the sound barrier for the first time, which is also the first time a civilian aircraft has done this over the US, and the eventual idea is to build a successor to the Concorde. That sounds both amazing and impossibly bad for the environment if it works. And talking of next big things, the reviews for the NVIDIA RTX 5090 and 5080 are out, and while the 5090 mostly seems to be a beast, the 5080 just barely seems to scrape by the 4080 series. That's pretty disappointing, but NVIDIA says that it will likely run out of RTX 5090 and 5080 cards this week due to significant demand anyway, so I guess people will just buy it anyway, oh well. And in pretty wild news, Apple was sued by the Democratic Republic of Congo for allegedly knowingly taking critical minerals via a quote, massive laundering and greenwashing operation run by armed groups. We don't know yet how much of this is true for sure, but yikes. Okay, and since I've been shooting videos across Asia for the last three weeks or so, I've once again been reminded what the kind of lifesaver my sponsor NordVPN can be, especially when traveling. Example one, Disney Plus just refuses to load for me in Southeast Asia, but with NordVPN on, it's no longer a problem. Example two, Signal, my main messenger, was blocked in Qatar, but worked just fine with Nord. Example three, a bunch of my finance apps refused to load in Malaysia, but worked just fine with Nord. And I could go on, but as a techie, you already know what a VPN does, and Nord has once again proven to be a great one. They provide rock solid connectivity using thousands of servers. You can choose from tons of countries to route your traffic through and even sometimes specific cities and speeds are so fast that I typically can't even tell when my VPN is on. You can connect multiple devices with a single plan and NordVPN is also very secure with all of your traffic being properly encrypted. With my link nordvpn.com slash checkout, which is also in the description, you can get four extra months for free if you get a two-year plan and there's also a 30-day money-back guarantee, so there's no risk in giving them a try. Again, that is nordvpn.com slash checkout and I'll see you next Friday.